ECC is based in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's a congressional uh, commission, and we monitor human rights violations and abuses in China and rule of law developments in China. Every year we publish an annual report, and we have a, a political prisoner database that includes um, Tibetan Falun Gong practitioners, political dissidents, and so forth. If you're interested, our website is www.cecc.gov. I'm very honored to be able to represent Chairman Jim McGovern today and read his statement. Today, Tibetans around the world will mark the 61st anniversary of the Tibetan National Uprising against Chinese rule, the moment when many Tibetans lost their lives and His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and that of his followers were forced to flee their homeland. In some countries, the commemorations will be public, like those held here in the United States. But Tibetans living in Tibet will not be able to come together to express their views, nor will Tibetans living in places like Nepal, where China exercises its influence to prevent Tibetans from remembering their own history. That's why it's so important you are here today. It's up to you to remember, to commemorate, to speak out and lead for those who cannot. People around the world know about Tibet and its history because of your persistence and your determination. Today I stand with you and with Tibetans all around the world in your struggle to ensure that Tibetans in China can exercise their basic human right to speak and teach their language, protect their culture, control their land and water, travel within and outside their country, select their religious leaders, and practice religion as they choose. And I am doing all I can as a member of Congress to make sure that United States foreign policy supports that struggle as well. My newest effort is the Tibetan Policy and Support Act of 2019, which passed the House of Representatives by an overwhelming bipartisan majority in January 2020 and is now being considered by the Senate. One really important thing this bill does is to write into U.S. law that succession or reincarnation of Tibetan Buddhist leaders, including the future 15th Dalai is an exclusively religious matter that should be decided solely by the Tibetan Buddhist community. Chinese officials who interfere in the succession or reincarnation process will be subject to targeted financial, economic, and visa-related sanctions, including those contained in the Global Magnitsky Act. The bill does other things as well. It strengthens the mandate to work with our allies to promote a genuine dialogue on Tibetan autonomy and protect the environment and water resources of the Tibetan Plateau. It mandates that no new Chinese consulates should be established in the United States until a U.S. consulate is established in Lhasa. It recognizes advances in democratic governance in the Tibetan exile community. One way we can all commemorate the 61st anniversary is to encourage the Senate to pass the bill. Last Congress, with your support, we passed into law the reciprocal access to Tibet. Now let's get the Tibet Health Act passed into law as well. We must also continue to demand that Tibet be freed, and that includes the Panchen Lama. No one should rest until all Tibetan prisoners are free and safe. 61 years since His Holiness was forced to flee his homeland, but your people haven't given up, and I haven't either. You are the reason we've made some progress. Let's keep it up and make some more. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Uh, thank you so much. This is really an honor for me to join and stand with the Tibetan community uh, in solidarity and with um, all of the wonderful student and older activists and government leaders and visionaries. And it's particularly an honor for me to join the other supporters um, of the Tibetan community. And I want to say a thank you also to Jennifer and to um, Congressman McGovern's office because the Congressman has consistently raised his voice in support for Tibetans, for Uyghurs, and for the Hong Kong people. So I want to say something about just a quick note about the coronavirus. Thank you all for coming out. And thank you all for coming together when we have all been advised not to come together. So just wash your hands, do good hygiene, and we can continue to do the work we need to do. I want to say one thing about East Turkestan and Tibet and Hong Kong and the coronavirus. The thing we all should keep in mind now is that what the Communist Party leaders are doing and the story they are telling is similar. So in East Turkestan, when the authority rounded up millions of ethnic Uyghurs and other groups, Cossacks and other groups, the rationale why they did it was because they needed to eradicate terrorism. Terrorism. And after they rounded up millions, the story they told the international community was, we succeeded. We succeeded in fighting terrorism because they're all locked up. In um, Wuhan, after China shut down the city of 11 million people, including people locked at home without medicine, food, health care, and access. And they locked down most of China. And the Chinese authorities said, we succeeded in the war against the virus. But the war against the virus was a war, is a war against people. It's a war against people. And the World Health Organization and World Health Organization, international media, and governments are echoing, adopting China's story. So if you hear this, they say, it was China's information control that contributed to this public health crisis. But it's also China's social control that saved us from a hundred thousand more deaths. No, it is not China's... Oh, oh did they shut off my mic? China. <laughs> no, it, they can't shut off our mic. China did not save the world through social control. It is not acceptable to have the human cost for what they claim is a battle they started. Let me say something secondly now, where are we now? in this moment, in this space. Well, if you look behind that building, across the street, maybe we're not in their sight lines, like they can't see us, but I hope they hear us. And what I'm talking about is, we are across from the United Nations headquarters. China is sitting as the president this month of the Security Council, and where inside the building, I am told, is an exhibition, an exhibition featuring the faces of happy Uyghur people. This is a ridiculous attempt to erase the fact of massive repression and suffering inside the borders. Across the street and down the road is where China is seeking to legitimize its policies and getting support from the international community. They are seeking to legitimize sinicization, de-radicalization, 
which is just euphemisms for cultural genocide. These are just euphemisms for trashing and trampling the rights of people, religious freedom, cultural rights, our language, our history, our memories. And they're trying to reach even ridiculously the spiritual realm. So the Communist Party wants to control reincarnation. They're trying to offer win-win, where the only party who wins is China. They're suggesting we have dialogue, no confrontation. And they don't mean peace and harmony that his, the Dalai Lama refers. They mean no accountability and total impunity. That's what they mean. Across the street and down the block is where China is introducing its models for democracy. Quote, it's hum China, human rights with Chinese characteristics. His, its model for development. But this year, <laughs> this year, 2020, is the 75th anniversary also of the United Nations Charter. But I want to remind, as we stand here, the first line of the UN Charter is, we, the peoples, we, the peoples of the United Nations. Not we, the authoritarian, the fascists, the dictators, the, 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 the dictators in training, the wannabe dictators. That's not what the line of the Charter says. It says, we, the peoples. And in the 42nd Street Metro stop, uh, Metro subway stop, when you come out, there's a big poster. You know what it says? United Nations. It's your world. Guess what? It is. And we're taking it back. So the we want to remember that the charter. I'm not going to read you the charter, but the important preamble says, we reaffirm our faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, of nations, small and large, and to establish conditions under which justice and respect for all can be maintained. So. We gather to remember the 61st anniversary of the Tibetan uprising. We in the world owe the Tibetan community and the Tibetan people a great debt. We need, owe you a debt and thank you for your persistence, your courage, your sacrifice. We remember and honor the sacrifices of the 154 lives lost and more. And Every year, as we gather to support you, we honor you and we thank you. For we too remember, we too remember Chinese human rights defenders, democracy activists, supporters around the world. We remember June 4th, the People's Liberation Army crushing unarmed democracy activists and trade unionists. We remember in Hong Kong, just this week, we remember the July 21st brutal attack by triad thugs against the residents of Yunlong while the police stood by and did nothing. We remember this week, August 31st, when the massive police assault on Hong Kong subway riders in Prince Edward Station. And we remember just this week, the death of Zhao Si Lok, the young man who supposedly fell from the third floor of a car park after participating in a protest. And Hong Kongers remember and put flowers and messages and prayers at all of these sites. And the police came and removed and tear gassed and said, this is litter. These expressions are litter. 
and you people gathering are rioters. You are participating in illegal assembly. But all of this will not erase our memory, and it will not erase the demands for the justice and for truth. Just as 61 years of repression has not, cannot, and will not erase the Tibetan people's just struggle. So together, we remember, because to remember is to resist. To remember is to resist. And we do not stand here and come together because we have hope, especially when most of the world says the Tibetan people cause is hopeless. The Hong Kong people's cause is hopeless because China is so powerful. No, we come together. We have hope because we have come together. There is hope because we stand up. We have hope because we act and we do this in solidarity. So, Semshuk Machak.